Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Dan here at uh, Rexmont EC Church in Rexmont, Pennsylvania, uh, the southern end of beautiful Lebanon County. I want to welcome you to our worship service this morning sermon. Uh, we are continuing this week in our potluck sermon series where members of the congregation can uh, give me some ideas as to what they want to to hear when I preach on uh, whether a favorite bible story or a favorite passage of scripture or a passage of scripture that they don't understand that they'd like some teaching on um, things like that <clears throat> so we are going to be looking today in uh, Genesis chapter 11 uh, the story of the Tower of Babel. I think it's a very powerful message for us today uh, in our particularly Western, particularly American society, for us to pay attention to some of the things God has been saying since before recorded history. But we want to begin by, I just want to let you know and talk to you a little bit about the tallest building in the world. <clears throat> the tallest building in the world is, of course, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It is 2,722 feet high, just over half a mile high. It's in Dubai. I had the opportunity of going and uh, traveling through Dubai once on my way back and forth to Kenya. It was like 118 outside, and so I didn't even leave the airport. Uh, but that this is where uh, the Burj Khalifa is. Uh, just to put it into a little bit of perspective and reference, um, if any of you have been to New York City and been up the Empire State Building, the Empire State Building is massive, 1,454 feet, so it's about half the size of the Burj Khalifa. A massively, massively tall building. And there is something just really impressive about tall buildings. Uh, because when a society can build something like that, it represents power and success and achievement. And it, and it usually means something is going on, something's going right for those that build it. Today's story, we are going to see what became of the people who went out and uh, on the earth after the flood. And we're going to learn about the Tower of Babel. Now, uh, just a little background. Noah and his family um, were cooped up in the ark for quite some time. We know the, the flood waters, the storm lasted 40 days and 40 nights, but we know the flood waters receded much more slowly. The Bible tells us that they were in the ark for over a year. And so I'm sure having been cooped up in the ark for that long, they were looking to get out of the ark as soon as they could. And uh, when, they, when they finally did <clears throat> come out of the ark, God gave them some instructions. Genesis chapter 9, verse 7, God tells Noah and his family, he says, As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Um, and so basically, he's telling them, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to repopulate the earth, spread out. Uh, you've got lots and lots of land available. So let's look at some of the, the major elements. First of all, Noah's descendants began to spread out. Uh, God's command there in Genesis 9, 7 was for them to be fruitful and multiply. And we see in chapter 10 of Genesis, they did just that. Now, I do have to let you know that Genesis chapter 10 is probably one of the most, one of the more boring chapters in the Bible to read. Uh, it, it is just a list of names, a list after list after list of names. It goes through Noah's 
sons' names and the grandsons' names and the great grandsons' names. It lists all of the nations of the world that, that resulted from each grandkid. It's, it is very dry. There's no cutting edge dialogue, there's no spellbinding story. And it can be kind of a drag to read Genesis chapter 10. But the very end of Genesis chapter 10, uh, verse 32, is, is the verse I want to point to. Because after listing all of those names, uh, the Bible reads in Genesis 10, 32, These are the clans of Noah's sons, according to the lines of descent within their nation. From these nations spread out all all over the earth after the flood. And I think that's the important part. God had commanded them to multiply, be fruitful, spread out, and that's what they did. Noah and his family and their descendants were obedient, at least for a time. They, they spread out over all the earth. <clears throat> but it didn't last for long. Some of Noah's descendants have come back together to make one unified and powerful people. And uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11, uh, that's where we're going to be today. And I want to begin by reading the first four verses here of Genesis chapter 11 as you follow along in, in your Bible. It says, uh, Genesis 11, 1 through 4, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. The, the people had settled near Shinar, uh, uh, some plain, and rather than spread out like God had said, they wanted to stay together and build power for themselves. Demonstrated in building this tower that reached the heavens, or, or maybe not, not physically reached in the heavens, but reached into the sky, far into the sky. Notice their motivation in, in uh, verse 4. Let's make a name for ourselves. I... I always found it interesting when I was teaching seventh grade Bible at, at RVA that uh, I would bring this up and say, what does it mean to make a name for yourselves? There were, in seventh grade, there were certain kids who understood what I was asking, but there was always a few kids who were like, you can't make a name for yourself. Your parents make your name. And like, no, no, that's not what we're talking about. What does it mean to make a name for yourself? Uh, and, and, and I think that's what's going on here. They've decided to, to make a name for themselves, to become famous, so that to, to, to have the whole world pointing at them and saying, wow, look what they can do. And uh, notice also that uh, their concern was if they, they didn't build the tower. Again, in verse 4, it says, otherwise we'll be scattered throughout the earth. Um, the result that they were concerned would, 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 th th that would come about is, is the very thing that God had commanded them to do. They didn't want to get spread out, and yet God had commanded them to. And finally, uh, God steps in, starting in verse 9, and decides to, to scatter the people. Uh, he said, Genesis 11, 5 through 9. But the Lord came down to the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse the language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over all the earth, and they stopped building that city. That's why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. You know, since the people had decided to not obey God, God decided to, to step in and, and, and help them obey. And that... 
I, I truly believe this was a sign of God's grace. Remember, not long before this, um, the earth had gotten so evil that God decided to destroy the entire earth with a flood because of the great sin of the world. And now God is trying to get everyone back on track. And they've started to disobey again. And so this time God steps in before things get too bad. Verse 6 seems to be a very concerning phrase. Uh, when it says in verse, verse 6, uh, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And, and I, think, I think what that is saying is implies that they will think nothing that the plans to do. It, when, it, when they say that, it, it, it's not that they will be able to do everything. It, what, what I think the concern is, is that if God allows them to continue to do this, they will become less and less dependent upon God in their own eyes. I don't think these people would literally come to the point where nothing was impossible for them, like they're the Avengers or something like that. I don't know if you know this, but just over 100 years ago, 1899, the director of the United States Patent Office petitioned the U.S. government to shut down his office because he had come to the conclusion that everything that could be invented had already been invented and there was no longer any need for the patent office. Can you imagine that? 1899, and, and the 20th century has just exploded in human ingenuity and inventiveness. A few of these inventions have centered on communications and, and transportation. And uh, this really has been over the last 125 years, the, the era of communication and transportation getting people together, moving them in one direction so that we're able to associate, we're able to work together. Somewhat of a reversal of what happened in the Tower of Babel when God spread them out over everything. There's no way that the director of the United States Patent Office could have imagined what would happen with computers and electronics and transistors and the, particularly the second half of the, of the 20th century. But Maybe he could have seen what was coming around the corner. In the year 1900, the photocopy machine was invented. In 1903, an editorial in the New York Times made the claim that it would take between 1 million and 10 million years before mankind would be able to fly. Eight days later, Orville and Wilbur Wright flew their plane at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. In 1907, the electric vacuum cleaner, eh, it was invented. Oh, aren't we all glad for that? <laughs> electric washing machine in 1907. In 1911, air conditioning and the automobile self-starter. You know what I mean by automobile self-starter? I mean, when I get into the car, I just put the key in and turn it. And it starts, you know, we take that for granted, you know, you used to have to get out front and crank the engine over. It was very physical. <laughs> Can you imagine doing that on a cold day or a hot day too? Ooh. Um, 1913, the refrigerator was invented and talking motion pictures. 1923, television, first forms of television. 1926, a liquid-fueled rocket. 1930, jet propulsion and the jet propulsion engine. 1938, the automatic clothes dryer. Okay, so washing machines in 1907, uh, dryers in 1938, a little bit of time in between those two. 1942, the nuclear reactor was invented. 1943, artificial kidney machine. 1953, the heart and lung machines. They're tremendous advances in technology in the 20th century and it accelerated too it's going faster and faster you want to know why because people are able to communicate they're able to get together there's a technology transfer it's going to go faster and faster with uh, what bill gates calls the information superhighway and this exchange of information is just amazing uh, today, the United States Patent Office issues about 76,000 patents every single year. <clears throat> they reject over 200,000 patents. 
So if you have an idea for an invention, you better have your ducks in a row now. It takes an awfully long time to get a patent. And it's very difficult. Human inventiveness is really one of the major stories of the 20th century, but so is the use of human evil of that inventiveness. It has been an evil century, hasn't it? As we look back over the last 120 years, there have been terrible tragedies, World War I, World War II, other wars that have been going on, uh, the advent of thermonuclear devices and weapons of mass destruction. We, we can see the propagation of evil throughout our society, and it is, even though it has been technologically advanced, it's still got a lot of problems. We're able to see and hear through the media, through radio, through television, the internet, and other communication outlets to find out very quickly about evil things that other people are doing, and you end up with copycat killers and, and other things like that. It's a pervasive spread of evil through technology. It is a tragic thing. God knew what could happen if Noah's descendants decided to just stick together. It would cause problems. So God decided to take care of the problem by confusing their language and then help them scatter again like God had commanded them to do in the first place. According to the Bible, the name of the place is called Babel or Babylon in, in, in Aramaic, Babel in Hebrew. Because that word sounds like the word for confusion. In the story, the Tower of Babel, we find uh, a few major truths about our world. Uh, the first major truth is that self-sufficiency is not what humanity needs. What we really need is God, not ourselves. God satisfies our needs. Philippians 4, 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Psalm 55, 22, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. We don't need more from this world or, or more from ourselves. We need more of God. He will supply all our needs. He will sustain us. Humanity sometimes thinks that we can become more advanced and more educated and more cultured to the point where we can handle things on our own. I remember back in the early 80s, Time Magazine having the article, uh, from front page article, uh, God is dead. We don't need him anymore. As smart as we think we are, we're not smart enough to realize that all we have to do is look around and realize we don't have everything under control. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Self-sufficiency is not what humanity needs. Second, no purpose of God's can be thwarted. God's plan for humanity is that they would spread out over the earth and be fruitful and multiply. No matter what humanity had in mind, no matter what the people of Babel had in mind, God would see his plans come to pass. And we think back to Job, and he learned this uh, about God. After 41 chapters of him learning about who God is, Job 42, 2, Job says, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. To thwart something means to oppose it or or prevent it from happening. No plan of God's can be opposed or prevented from happening. I should have mentioned this last week in my sermon about Abraham and Isaac. I had said that Abraham needed to decide whether he was going to follow God or not. And it was a watershed moment in history. And I posited the question, what would have happened had Abraham not chosen to take his son up that mountain, and I, I knew that you know, maybe the nation of Israel wouldn't have existed, and if, and if Israel hadn't come about, what would that have done to the birth of Jesus? But just like here in, in Babel and, and in Job, in Abraham's circumstances, the plan of God would still come to pass. If Abraham had chosen to disobey God's, God, God's plan would still have been fulfilled, because nothing can thwart God's plan. And that goes for today as well. God's plan will succeed. God has a plan for you, for your family, for this church, for the, the city of Rexmont, where we are, for Lebanon County and Lebanon Town, for this entire world. 
and that plan will succeed. You're going to want to join God in his plan. Things will go much better if you do. Finally, God has a, a global plan. Remember, God said, be fruitful and multiply. God wanted his people to occupy the whole earth. All the people of earth descended from Noah. That means all the people of earth belong to God. God loves the variety of his created people. All this time on earth, God doesn't want us all hooked up together with one language, one ethnicity, one culture, one location. He, wants them, he wanted us to spread out and be fruitful. And share in each other's burdens. And, and, and share in each other's culture. More than that, God has a plan to see all people from all over the earth come to him in worship. Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, You'll receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the whole ends of the earth. Revelation 7, verse 9 and 10 is one of my most favorite passages. It says, and after this, I looked up, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe and nation in people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Our God is a global God, and he has a global plan. The plan is not only for physical flourishing of people all over the world, but for spiritual rescue of people from all over the world. And I love the fact that our, our church and our denomination is so heavily involved in, in mission work and in spreading the good news of the gospel around the world. Let's take a look at um, some, the, some, some final truths, the, the gospel really, how the gospel speaks to us. First of all, we need to understand that we need God. We need God more than anything. We need God more than we need technology. We need God more than we need financial prosperity. We need God more than we need love and harmony. We need God more than we need world peace. We need God more than we need a cure for the coronavirus or monkeypox or whatever the, the next new disease is going to be. We need God more than we need acceptance and belonging. We need God more than we need answers to racial tensions we need god more than we need a cure for the drug crisis we need god more than we need a fix to mental health issues we need god more than anything and when we discover that we need god and we seek him out all of these things god will provide the story of the tower of babel reminds us of one of the core truths of the bible all that we really need is found in god and we can only get to God through the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Secondly, there's unity, glory, and power found in Jesus. Here's the irony. All that the people of the Tower of Babel were trying to find was actually found in a greater way in God. Now, we and all the rest of humanity have access to all the incalculable riches of God through the work of Jesus Christ. Do you want to have real unity? We find it in Jesus. Do you want to have real glory? We find it in Jesus. Do we want to have real power? We find it in Jesus. Do we want to have real blessings, real peace, real rest, real prosperity, real healing, real love, real forgiveness, real wisdom? We find it in Jesus. You can't beat the real thing. Come to Jesus and experience life in a whole new way. We need God. As Jesus himself said, it's only through him that we can experience God. Let's let the story of the Tower of Babel remind you of this truth as a summarized in our bottom line. And the bottom line of our story today is, apart from Jesus, humanity will never reach great heights. 
I'm not saying you'll not do anything impressive. After all, we have the iPhones and electronics and, you know, robot vacuum cleaners, and drones that can deliver packages and buildings that are half a mile high into the sky. Ten years from now, that stuff won't be impressive anymore. And it's never impressive to God. God has within himself true greatness. And we have access to that through the work of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll only reach greatness through Jesus. And if you think about it, just consider how great you can be without Christ. What could you do by your own power? Yeah, you could start up the next major tech company or perhaps build a successful church. And perhaps you could raise a nice family, retire and spend the rest of your days in peace and prosperity all by your own work. Well, even that's not by your own work, is it? Because every breath you breathe is a gift of God. But let's say God gave you a little help with the bare minimums concerning how great you can be without the work of Christ. But then consider how great you could be with Christ. How great could you be with Christ? If all the Bible says regarding Jesus, what Jesus can do and through you is true, you can, you can be so great. Take some time this week and consider if there were no limits to what Jesus could do in your life, how great you could be in Christ. Here's the question for you to consider. Do you want to be as great as you can be by your own power? Or do you want to be as great as you can be in Christ? And I hope that's a question each of us will answer this week. And then let me give you a, the, the, the answer. There is no limit to how great you can be in Christ. So choose wisely.